property. It comes from biology. Think about a word like mammals. Mammals have a whole bunch of properties. We have warm blood, we produce milk, we give birth to live offspring. And if an animal has enough of those properties, we say, okay, that's a mammal. But it's not a whole. So, and we are recording this, so if folks are not here, uh, they will be able to uh, watch it after the fact, or if they come a little late. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, thank you everybody for coming. Um, my name is Christian John Lullis, if you don't know me, and I am the co-founder and executive director of the Peggy Lullis Foundation. Um, so this is part of our quarterly webinar series. Um, this is uh, the third that we've done. Uh, a few a weeks back, we did um, <clears throat> we did one on the regulation of fecal microbiota transplant. Um, we did one. Um, my brain is for some reason not remembering what the last one we did was. So forgive me, um, <laughs> but uh, I will I will let you know when I remember. Um, so um, we are uh, going to have um, a really interesting, fascinating discussion from Dr. John Alberti of the University of Chicago. Um, he's our presenter tonight. Um, but before we get to that, um, just a few housekeeping items. Um, so we wanna thank uh, our sponsor, um, Faring Pharmaceutical. They are sponsoring this webinar series through an unrestricted educational grant. Um, I want you all to know that Faring did not play any role in developing any of the content. Um, this is purely Dr. Alverdi's uh, academic presentation. Um, and whatever I say is my responsibility. Uh, <laughs> so keep that in mind. Um, and <clears throat> if you're not familiar with us, um, we started Peggy Lillis Foundation in the summer of 2010, following the death of my mother, Peggy, from a community acquired C. diff infection. Um, PLF is now probably the leading national patient advocacy organization for C. diff. Um, we pursue our mission by educating the public, empowering advocates, and shaping policy. Um, we've been very interested lately in the Pastor Act, which was introduced in the House and the Senate. Um, and a few other things. Um, and um, just so you have a, a sense, you know, my mother was a kindergarten teacher. Um, she was just 56 years old when she passed away. And so we started this webinar series because what we wanted to do was take, you know, really smart academic information, you know, sort of cutting edge science and bring it to an audience um, in a way that's understandable to the average person who cares about this issue. Um, my mother became a kindergarten teacher because she believed that education was power. Um, and if you're educated about the microbiome, about C. diff, you are going to be, be you are going to be better able to protect yourself and your family. Um, and so, to that end, our primary mission is that we're building a movement to combat C. diff infections. And so, if you're not involved with us uh, already, we hope you will get involved. Um, and I'll touch base about how you can do that at the end of the presentation. Um, so with all that said, it is my great pleasure to introduce um, Dr. John Alverdy. Um, Dr. Alverdy is the Sarah and Harold Lincoln Thompson Professor of Surgery, Executive Vice Chair of the Department of Surgery, and Associate Director of the National Institutes of Health funded Digestive Disease Research Center Core at the University of Chicago. He is also a fellow of the Institute of Molecular Engineering at the University of Chicago. Dr. Alverdy has been been continuously R01 funded by the NIH for over 20 years and has trained over 100 undergraduate students, graduate students, medical students, and surgical research fellows in his laboratory. He studies the molecular pathogenesis of infection-related surgical complications, such as sepsis, surgical site infections, and anastomotic leak. I asked him how to pronounce that, and I completely forgot immediately. Um, he is the past president of the Surgical Infection Society, past recipient of the Rabdin Lectureship and Surgical Forum Dedication from the American College of Surgery, and recipient of the Flans Carl Award from the American Surgical Association. He is co-founder and chief scientific officer of Covera Surgical, Covira Surgical, which develops non-antibiotic polymer-based anti-infective compounds to combat post-operative infection. 
Dr. Alfred, <clears throat> excuse me, Dr. Alverdi attended medical school at the Autonomous University of Guadalajara and Loyola University and received his surgical, surgical training at the University of Chicago affiliated with Michael Reese Hospital. He completed a surgical research fellowship at the University of California, San Francisco under the mentorship of Dr. George Sheldon and Donald Trunke. Dr. Alverdi has an active practice involving minimally invasive robotic surgery of esophagus, stomach, and pancreatic pancreatic bi biliary tree. Okay, then you had, to, you had to make that last one real difficult for me, right, Dr. Uh... <laughs> not bad, not bad, not bad. Not bad. Uh, oops, let me get out of this. Um, and so let me end sharing. Sorry, guys. You don't must think I hadn't been using Zoom for the past 17 months. Um, so you have to stop sharing so I can share. Yeah, that's it. what I'm trying to do. It's not. There should be something. Oh, there it is. There we go. There we go. Sorry about that, guys. So can everybody see this? Looks that way. Should be. Yeah, I can see yeah. it. Good. Excellent. All right. So I'm going to move this to the right a little bit. And uh, thank you very much, Christian, for that uh, very nice introduction. And I want to again thank the Peggy uh, Lillis Foundation for the uh, kind invitation and uh, the um, honor of uh, presenting to all of you. Uh, I'm uh, very happy to answer any questions at the end of this um, presentation. It will be uh, about 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, and I will touch on a few topics that I think will be of interest to everybody. Um, this is the group I work with, uh, the photo on the left there on your left screen. Uh, these are the people that work in my laboratory and I'm fortunate enough to be able to be a physician scientist working where I actually do surgery and take care of patients as well as uh, able to have a laboratory because I'm surrounded by really smart people uh, who helped me along the way, including uh, the Institute of Molecular Engineering, uh, the Microbiome Center, uh, and, uh, and others. And I want to, again, thank the National Institutes of Health for supporting our work over the last 20 years. Uh, it's important to recognize that, of course, that we're in the middle of a pandemic now. And we've learned a lot, I think, from this pandemic, both uh, personally and nationally. And one of it is that despite all of our technology, we know that microbes can still hurt us and even kill us. And uh, that's always seems to be somebody else's problem, but it, it became everybody's problem all at once. We now know that infections can uh, affect um, all aspects of our life, our health, our businesses, our patients, our families, and even our elective surgery schedules, if you happen to be a, a surgeon. And some people have uh, made the comment that this COVID-19 pandemic is just a dress rehearsal uh, for what is to come. You know, it's important to recognize that science is a process, not a result. Its best outputs emerge from experiments that are solution agnostic. Now, I hope many of you are vaccinated uh, and it's important to recognize that we uh, developed this vaccine, not we, but others developed this vaccine um, in a very short period of time. It, it, it's almost unprecedented how quickly this vaccine went from uh, sequencing the COVID-19 uh, coronavirus to actually developing a scalable vaccine that could be injected into people's arms. And it began 30 years ago with a physician scientist, uh, Dr. Wolf, working at the University of Wisconsin, who had the idea that he could inject a uh, you know, messenger RNA into the muscle of a mouse and make that mouse produce the exact encoded protein of that gene sequence. And of course, you can imagine that this uh, manuscript was rejected several times. It underwent multiple revisions. His grants got rejected. But this is 30 years ago. And, and, and that really formed the basis of how we were able to take, um, you know, a a infectious agent, sequence it genetically, and then develop therapy that could neutralize uh, and, and contain uh, the virus so that those of us that are vaccinated are protected from developing severe disease. And we need to think about that. I certainly need to think about that in the context of surgical site infections, because we're at a very low rate, thank goodness, because of sterility, 
um, protocols because of uh, antibiotics. Um, and surgical site infections that include wound infections or anastomotic leaks where when you sew two pieces of bowel together, they fall apart or sepsis due to antimicrobial resistant uh, drugs are still a threat to patients. And our current approach is to maintain sterility and give antibiotics. And it seems that our future approach is to maintain more sterility and give more antibiotics with the reasoning that if some is good, more must be better. The problem is more of the same is not an evolutionarily stable strategy. When you have a post-operative infection, if you look at those patients who had one versus those that didn't after an elective surgery procedure, they have a three to four time increase in the chances of developing a second infection and dying from it. And so there's something about the exposure to antibiotics and getting an infection when we go into the hospital after an elective surgery operation. Keep in mind that there are about 100,000 elective surgery operations done every day in the United States. And surgeons are promiscuous antibiotic prescribers include dentists, plastic surgeons, podiatrists, and other surgeons. You know, antibiotics are dispensed to outpatients. Um, that is about five prescriptions written each year for every six people in the United States. I mean, it's staggering. And 30% of the antibiotics prescribed in the outpatient setting are unnecessary. And finally, total inappropriate antibiotic use, inclusive of unnecessary use and inappropriate selection, dosage, and duration, may approach 50% of all outpatient antibiotic use. So it, it's, it's important in this context to think about infections such as COVID-19 and uh, Clostridialis difficile or C. diff simply as diseases of human progress. And these diseases have been here a long time, but we never really saw them at this sort of epidemic or pandemic proportions as we had that we are seeing now. And it, it may be that we fail to understand that killing all life on earth that threatens us is not an evolutionarily stable strategy. And it strikes me, I, I was watching somebody um, um, in my neighborhood on an electric scooter and then somebody else on an electric bicycle. And I thought to myself, well, we all go to sleep. We're plugging in millions of devices, our cell phones, our computers, our, our cars, you know, now our scooters, now our bicycles we're probably using more electricity than we've ever used before. And after this COVID pandemic, I have no doubt that year to year, we're using more antibiotics, not less. And what's interesting is at the same time, and I know many of you on this, uh, on this uh, webinar are, are farm IDs, we're trying to you know, you know, develop programs of antibiotic stewardship, but surgeons are also saying, you know what? To get to zero, to get closer to zero, we need to give more antibiotics, not less. Here's an article from a very uh, close friend of mine who lives in Chicago, is just moving to San Francisco now, I.J. Maker, who did this really brilliant study looking at the NISCRIP database. And he found that infection rates go down if you just broaden the coverage and add more antibiotics. So what message does that tell us? Surgeons want to use more and we're told we need to use less, but year to year we're using more because we have the sense that more is better. And you know, we're at a point now where you know, we just can't stop using antibiotics. I mean, think about this for a moment. Antibiotics came from you know, soil fungi and we've now scaled it up and made metrics, metric tons of it and we're spreading it all over the place on crops, in animals and on our patients. And, and, and now half the bugs that cause infections after surgery are antibiotic resistant. And that's a little bit of a scary um, um, you know, uh, fact. Uh, there are a number of uh, very impressive uh, physician scientists who are saying that the next pandemic is going to be antibiotic resistant organisms that are causing surgical site infections or surgical infections after surgery. You go in for an elective spine or hip or gallbladder operation and you end up with a very scary multi-drug resistant uh, bacteria. So 
many of you may think, how do you get a post-operative infection when you think about dirty instruments and you know, breach and sterile technique or the hospital is dirty, whatever, but none of those have been proven really to be the causative agents in post-operative infections because we, we don't track the, the vectorial movement of bacteria from the environment to the wound. And it's important to remember that in the best hospitals, in the hands of the best surgeons, patients still develop life-threatening post-operative infections. So this more of the same thinking is, you know, no bueno, not good. You know, we really need to think about another approach. So it's important to recognize, and I always show this slide, and I really do like this slide. The surgeon, this is a colostomy on the left, and the surgeon sutures contaminated colon mucosa to the skin, then places a prosthesis under the colon and against an open wound. And then we put a bag over this stoma, we create this greenhouse effect with humidity and moisture that fosters bacterial growth. Let me just tell you as a practicing surgeon, patients almost never get a wound infection when you make a colostomy or an ileostomy. How can you explain that? Well, infections occur when you make a wound and you spill some bacteria in there. You, you know, you cut the colon and you, that's, you got, that's why there's E. coli in there. Okay. How come a colostomy doesn't cause an infection 100% of the time? Uh, well, and what this tells us is that bacteria are necessary, but alone not sufficient to cause a wound infection. Obviously, you can't have a wound infection without bacteria, but bacteria alone, because we're suturing the colon right to, this, to the wound, bacteria alone are insufficient. Something else is going on. And yet our approach seems to make sense. Here on the left, you can see there's a compound that's chlorhexidine gluconate, and there's a bottle that you screw together and you just, you just spray it in the wound. Orthopedic surgeons actually take the vancomycin powder now and instead of reconstituting in saline injected IV, they actually literally pepper the open wound, the hip, spine, knee with vancomycin powder. Wound protectors, there was a recent prospective randomized trial on wound protectors after pancreatic odontectomy had no effect in reducing surgical site infections. A group of colorectal surgeons go, I've got a new idea. We're going to take gel foam. We're going to soak it in jetamycin and stick it in the wound afterward, increase the infection rate. This crazy apparatus on the right is something people are trying to sell you. They say, listen, over the operative field, put this little, this little hose in there, it'll suck the particulate matter. And in fact, they're able to show that particulate matter decreases when you use that versus not use that. Had no effect on wound infection rates, but it did decrease the particulate Again, as if wound infections are proven to occur as a result of some type of intraoperative contamination event. So far, that's unproven. So with C. diff infection, again, we think someone did something wrong for us to be able to understand how that pathogen was able to be transferred to a hospitalized patient. When in fact, genetic studies suggest that you likely brought it in with you, you had an underlying disease diagnosis, you received antibiotics and other things occurred. Not all the time, but many times. And so it's time that we rethink how pathogens travel from one host to the next. And even when you give oral antibiotics, and I'm gonna to touch on this later, before colorectal surgery, it increases the rate of Clostridium difficile colitis. Why? Because you're wiping out the normal microbiome. So this concept of, well, you must have bad immune system or you must have gotten a big dose of this germ, this idea does not actually hold up scientifically. It's too simple. And there are even studies showing that patients' willingness to accept antibiotic side effects to reduce SSIs after colorectal surgery diminishes when they start to understand what those side effects actually are. So we're now at a point at which 
you know, we're in this uh, trade-off scenario where we have to decide to what extent do we add more antibiotic with the trade-off of actually having more super infections. This is a patient of mine. He was 33 years old. Uh, for those of you that can read this CAT scan, uh, his colon is very thickened here. Uh, and he has a C. diff colitis. He was 33 years old. He underwent a bone marrow transplant uh, for a uh, blood uh, cancer. And I walked into the room and he was tachycardic. Um, he was, uh, had low urine output. He looked very sick. And uh, I took him to the operating room and did a colectomy on him, removed his colon. And as I say, there are only two ways to get to O'Hare Airport, Chicago, too early or too late. And there are only two ways to do a total colectomy in a patient with C. diff colitis, too early or too late. If you do it too early, the infectious disease people say, well, you know, I probably could have saved that colon if you just gave me a few more hours to add some more antibiotics. And if the patient dies, you say, well, why didn't you operate sooner? The problem is you have to remove the whole colon and bring out a stoma. And then you have to close that later, which I did in this gentleman. Uh, he was 33 years old. A year later, I closed this colon and he got a, a, a big um, uh, in a midline and hernia. And then he had to have a second, a third procedure. Uh, it's not a benign procedure to take out somebody's total colon. And so, you know, we violate often the first commandment of surgery, which is thou shall not operate on the day of the patient's death. You certainly don't want to operate too late, but you don't want to operate too early. And it makes it very difficult to take care of these patients. We developed a alternative to total colectomy, which was a diverting loop ileostomy with colonic lavage, which has uh, gained a lot of traction worldwide, where instead of removing the colon, we bring out a loop colostomy put a catheter in there and flush the colon with liters and liters of uh, uh, LR or normal saline with vancomycin and, and has worked very effectively. Now, this is the most important slide I'm gonna show you in this talk. And I wanna just emphasize that bacteria are necessary, but alone not sufficient to cause infection. First of all, host factors must be released. There must be some level of stress in the host and the bacteria that colonize that host, that are either in the lung or the nose or in the gut, get signaled by those host factors. And they feed back on the host such that there is this what I call interkingdom signal exchange or learning loop. It's a recursive molecular dialogue in which both host and pathogen are communicating. Bacteria are communicating with each other through a system of quorum sensing. And so there's interspecies and intraspecies signal exchange, such that there is a matchless web of dense dynamic interactions that are driven by cues unique to the environmental context. So when you think of virulence of a particular germ or pathogen, if it is neither a property of the pathogen nor that of the host, but rather a property of their interaction. And this is why we are struggling with COVID-19 and we struggle with C. diff. A lot of people have C. diff, but they never get the colitis and the infection. Some people get diarrhea and it becomes self-limited. And other unfortunate people get diarrhea, severe colitis, and they die. And we don't really understand those complex dynamics because they're very complicated. It can't just be torn apart and say, okay, here's the gene or here's the cytokine or here's the bug uh, genotype that needs to be killed or here's the new antibiotic that will solve the all, pro all the problems. Jacques Menard, who discovered mRNA, this is why we have a vaccine today. He said, all organisms are changed by experience. No two pathogens are alike and no two strains of a pathogen are exactly alike. So what is the experience of the microbiome? Well, it turns out that the microbiome is very important. Your own gut normal bacteria are very important to provide tonic stimulation to your immune system beyond your GI tract, in your liver, in your blood, in your brain, everywhere. 
And there is now an emerging uh, body of evidence to suggest that dietary composition and how it interacts with the microbiome plays a very important role in the outcome when you are exposed to an infectious stress, a traumatic stress, or a surgical stress. And remember, antibiotics are a double-edged sword because they kill the pathogen that we are worried about, that is the offensive pathogen, but they also have collateral damage to the microbiome. And the foods that we eat are the medicine that keep that microbiome diverse, robust, and producing the metabolites that drive um, the immune system into high gear. And so it's important to think about now the life history of your microbiome. Well, what do you mean life history? Well, your prior antibiotic use, your travel history, your diet, your medications, your underlying diseases, the prior infections and surgeries that you've had, because all of this now matters. So what I'm studying in my laboratory is how those um, three components interact, diet, the microbiome, and the immune system. And it turns out that loss or gain of microbiota mutualism, either from multiple extended antibiotics, because you're eating the wrong foods, because you uh, have a very uh, uh, you know, um, significant perturbation of your physiologic system, you can lose your microbiome function and lose what I call these immunoregulatory metabolites that drive the immune system. And what we try to do in surgery is give you a single dose of an antibiotic and resume your diet immediately. You know, uh, and that can be done if you have minimally invasive surgery or you're in one of these enhanced recovery programs where you get regular solid food as quickly as possible, get out of the hospital and you maintain microbiome function. And so it turns out, and I'll show you some examples of this, that plant-based food drives your microbiome to produce these immunoregulatory metabolites that diffuse through your gut and end up touching and activating immune cells like macrophages, such that there's homeostatic gene expression in these immune cells so that they behave exactly like they're supposed to. They clear the pathogen without causing too much collateral damage by the cytokines they produce. So the food that you eat produces indispensable immune regulating, uh, immune stimulating gut bacterial derived metabolites that are critically necessary to fight infection. So now, you know, the big names, Gates, Zuckerberg, Binoff, they think the next blockbuster drug will come from inside your gut. And that comes in the form of a fecal microbial transplant, which I know all of you know a lot about because of, uh, because of its uh, success in treating a Clostridium difficile or Clostridialis difficile diarrhea and uh, sepsis. Um, people, there are about 50 to 100 different startup companies trying to develop the perfect, what I call a crapsule, a capsule that contains all the microbiota you need to stay healthy. And then there's the simple way, which is a high fiber, low fat plant-based diet. This is a study that just came out literally uh, a few weeks ago uh, from Poland. It was published in uh, GUT, which is a very high impact journal. And they described two interesting cases of patients treated with a fecal microbiota transplant to treat Clostridialis difficile infection, which, which coincidentally were performed just before initial symptoms of coexisting COVID-19 and the COVID-19 rapidly resolved. It's important to think about what constitutes nature-inspired design. What does that even mean? Nature-inspired design is where we think about how the microbiota interacts. And I can tell you from ba very basic work in my laboratory that when microbes get the proper nutrients they need to grow and reproduce, all those host cues I talked to you about, all those stress factors, a bacteria become insens insensate to those incoming host cues. You need to provide your microbiome with what I, what I call public goods so everybody behaves nicely in the sandbox. 
Unprocessed foods enable the biologic marketplace in the microbiome to produce immunoregulatory metabolites that are critical to fight infection. Now, pharmaceutical companies, they want to sell you chemically defined foods. Uh, you should know that this is not this. I mean, think about what you see on the right side of the screen. There are, you know, protozoa, fungi, bacteria, nematodes, uh, root nodules that drive the production of these plants that we eat as natural foodstuffs. This cannot be simply recapitulated by these types of foods. It's a matchless web of dense dynamic interactions. And remember, no one ever will be making wine and cheese in a chemistry laboratory. It's really complicated because the grapes have to be come from the right you know, climate and the right dirt. And there's a lot, of, lot underneath that dirt that makes those grapes exactly right. Billions of years of complexity is built into grapes. Now, this is a great story. And it's a really interesting story that illustrates the power of the microbiome. And this is uh, this, this nun, there's, a, there's actually a PBS home movie about the cheese nun. And she got her PhD in microbiology at the University of Connecticut, and then took a sabbatical, got a, a Rhodes Scholarship or a MacArthur Genius Award or one of these, uh, no, Fulbright, a Fulbright uh, Foundation Award to go travel to uh, France. And there happened to be an outbreak of listeria at that time. And the public health group in France decided that the nuns that were using unpasteurized milk to make cheese in these funny wooden bowls, which that had a lot of cracks in them that you clearly couldn't sterilize. The Board of Health said to these nuns, you need to make your cheese in this monastery using stainless steel uh, uh, bowls and you have to use pasteurized milk. Well, they started growing so much E. coli in their cheese that their cheese was no longer useful. They had been making this cheese for decades. It turned out that it was the germs inside the cracks of these wooden bowls that was making the pasteurized milk unhospitable to anything that came in there, sort of public goods, if you will, home field advantage, if you will. They could not grow anything bad in the unpasteurized milk, wooden bowl producing cheese. But when they pasteurized the milk and put it in stainless steel uh, bowls, everything grew in it. This sort of history of how our microbiome has evolved to protect us can't just be usurped by a chemistry lab that says, drink this before surgery and you'll be better. So here's an interesting study we did in our laboratory. We uh, took mice, and remember these are inbred mice, and we fed them a Western diet for six weeks. And that's a long time because mice only live a year. And then we gave them antibiotics, made them NPO after midnight, and then did an operation, sort of a physiologic stress. Uh, and what we did is then, examine their microbiomes through the course of all of this. And we saw right away that this prep, uh, if, if you ate rat chow or mouse chow, this didn't happen. But if you ate that Western diet, your microbiome did not do well. The Western diet depleted the health promoting anaerobes and key relevant metabolites in the gut. The Western diet enriches the anastomotic site, that wound that we created, with flesh-eating collagenolytic enterococci that caused leaks and multi-drug resistant bacteria. It increased the incidence up to 75% in severity of anastomotic leak in these mice. And, and the leaks were bad. Leaks that we saw in the control group, maybe one to 5% of the time, we're now seeing it more than 50% of the time. And it was directly related to the diet and the diet's effect on the microbiome. Well, I showed these data to this man, uh, Professor Harry Flint, who uh, came to the University of Chicago from Scotland. And he said, I bet you can reverse that in two days. I'm like, two days? It took six weeks for these animals to jazz up their microbiome. He goes, two weeks. And Harry Flint 
is uh, the world's expert on nutrition and the gut microbiome. And indeed he was correct. We did the study and we published it in the British Journal of Surgery and here's how it went. We fed these animals uh, uh, Western diet for six weeks. And then before we operated on them, only two days before we began their normal diet of chow. Remember it's plant-based, no meat, low fat, low sugar. The high fat diet has very little fiber and high fat and sugar in it. And the animals, they get fat when they're on the Western diet and they like it. They actually eat it and they're fine. They look fine, but they have hyperglycemia. They have fatty liver infiltration, visceral fat. And you know, when you look at this, you're like, you're not reversing that in two days. That took six weeks to get there. This two days is not going to do anything. It's not going to happen. When in fact, it made a huge difference in the anastomotic leak rate. And we were able to define when the microbiome was ready for surgery by feeding them and then checking the microbiome and doing some very complicated, both metabolomics and uh, sequencing of the bacteria. And in fact, we can even eliminate infection-related mortality for major surgery in mice with just short-term, less than a week of dietary rehab. So when we start to think about the future of elective surgery, we need as surgeons to pay more attention to what goes on in a patient's life beforehand. And we need to think about what I call dietary prehab before surgery, where we give them a plant-based, high-fiber, low-fat diet, days where we're, we're still in the process of figuring out exactly when the microbiome readiness will occur. And then we need to limit and we need to personalize antibiotics based on a history of these patients, how many surgeries they've had before, where they've traveled, what antibiotics they've taken previously, et cetera. And, and we've developed several compounds that are eco-neutral non-antibiotic strategies, not to kill bacteria, but to contain them and neutralize them. Remember that when COVID pandemic hit, all the cytokinologists and immunologists came out. They said, oh, we got to block IL-6 and oh, we can try this drug. And how about some humor? It's the immune system that's killing the patient. Nothing worked better than the vaccine. The vaccine, doesn't kill the virus. It just doesn't allow it to enter. It neutralizes it. It contains it. The virus will always be there. Nothing has worked better than focusing on the pathologic agent rather than trying to manipulate this immune system, which is a complex web of dense dynamic interactions. To illustrate that, I just want to show you this. And I think this is uh, one of my last slides that July 8th, 1899, I found this paper uh, by Bernie Yao and others uh, from King's College in England. And they write, we are, and remember it's 1899, no DNA, no antibiotics. We are still very much in the dark as to the precise mode of action of pathogenic microbes. But we do know that their activities and their virulence vary greatly according to their environment and that it is not necessary to kill them in order to make them relatively harmless. This is an evolutionarily stable strategy, not more antibiotics. So if you're having elective surgery, you might consider the following, or your patients are having elective surgery. Obviously choose a surgeon with a practice limit to a few procedures that he or she, uh, she or he does often and at high volume. Um, if you take an antibiotics in the last six months, discuss deferring surgery with your surgeon and think about ways to rebuild that. Eat a healthy natural food diet the week before surgery consisting of unprocessed plant-based food, no alcohol, no red meat, no refined sugar. If you are overweight, consider the above diet as a way to lose 10 pounds under the supervision of a physician or registered dietitian. And avoid all chemically defined diet supplements that come with the claim supports the immune system or supports the health of the microbiome. It's right in front of you. And finally, I wanna thank uh, Christian John Lewis for the uh, gracious invitation to give this talk. 
uh, in the honor of this podium, and uh, and uh, Debbie Goff uh, for introducing me to Christian uh, and the uh, Peggy Lewis Foundation, which is uh, really uh, remarkable. And we need to stamp out this disease and think about alternative ways to make its incidence decrease year to year. Thank you very much. And I will stop there and answer any questions that you have. Well, thank you so, so much. That was very interesting. Uh, I knew it was gonna be uh, a fascinating uh, look at this disease and sort of the processes behind it. Um, so <clears throat> we definitely have some time for questions or comments. Um, <clears throat> and I have uh, two that I think can get us rolling. Um, and so if folks want two ways to ask questions, you can either post them in the chat and I will, you know, Dr. Alverde and I will, will look for them there. Um, you can also raise your hand uh, through Zoom and I'll call on you and you can come up mute and ask the question if you want. Um, that would be great either way. Um, I think, we, you know, and also you might need to just a couple minutes to process all of that great information. So, <laughs> um, so I'll be the spoiler. Um, and so I think the first thing is, you know, we have all of us been raised to see germs as the enemy, right? Um, you know, we've been told, you know, do you want to sterilize stuff? Do you want to clean with bleach? I mean, I remember growing up, I had a friend's mother who like, if you walked into her kitchen, it smelled like bleach. And, you know, as a result, I think that the idea that like, what we're looking to achieve, you know, is homeostasis. And then, you know, the pandemic with now we're wearing masks, we're hand sanitizing, we're doing all this stuff, <clears throat> made sense in the moment, but it sounds to me like what you're thinking about is how do we sort of boost everything, boost our ability to be exposed to these germs and not get sick as a result of them, um, which is really a, a completely different mindset than the one that we've been approaching infectious disease diseases from for at least my lifetime. Do you think that's true? Do you think we need to kind of focus less on the bug and more on our ability to fight the bug? Yeah, you know, I, th those are great comments, uh, Christian. Thank you. You know, um, it, it is true that we are over sanitizing ourselves and, and the world around us. And that's why I say it's not an evolutionarily stable strategy. Obviously, there's this pandemic and we want to shield ourselves from the contagion. And that's what we did when we put the masks on. But it was clear that without a, a vaccine, we were going to lose the battle, right? And so, you know, we, we, we vaccinated ourselves. And I think there's been a big push, at least among my patients and things I've heard from others, to, to improve our health as a nation. Because we all know, and, you know, and I'm, I'm as guilty as anybody else, the foods that we love are not necessarily the foods that are good for us. The things that we enjoy doing are not necessarily the things that we have to do them in moderation. And we don't want to be an unhealthy nation. And we don't want to expect that there's not gonna be another pandemic. And so we talk about in medicine, what are modifiable risk factors? What, what are they that you and I can control? And one of them, is going to be uh, improving our own health and thinking about the foods that we eat, the antibiotics that we take, and just how much we sterilize our environment. I can just tell you in the operating room, we've reached a point where we don't know how to go from where we are, which is very good and very low, to zero. And at the same time, all the farm IDs are saying to us, use less antibiotics. The surgeons are doing studies going, hey, if you use more, you use, get less infections. Where do we go with that? Should we just start using more and more? Should, you know, I mean, we, we need to regroup and rethink. And I think you bring up a very important point. Um, I think we need to take control of our own health and we need to be less sterile overall. 
Yeah, so we have two good questions in the in the chat, which I'm going to go to in one second, but I just want to give an example from my own personal life just recently. Um, so I have a three year old nephew, which if you follow the Peggy Little Foundation, you'll hear about him because he's my mother's only grandchild um, and I'm obsessed. Um, so after 18 months of being in the house and not starting preschool on time, and also because of the pandemic, he recently started preschool. I think he went for five days and came home with this, you know, the RSV virus, very common virus uh, for toddlers and infants. Um, <clears throat> I watched him, I picked him up from school. Uh, he was not sick yet, or he was, you know, uh, infected probably. And I was with him for about four hours. Uh, I went home uh, and the next day my brother called me and said, Grayson's sick, we, we have to cancel our pool party. Um, I went over anyway and hung out with him again. I've never gotten sick. My sister-in-law and my brother have both gotten it. Uh, they both eat a different diet than I do. <laughs> and also neither of them really take much exercise and I exercise for four days a week. And so, you know, to me, I just feel like my immune system is better able to get this virus and not get sick from it. You know, um, it's hard to prove a counterfactual, but that's, you know, my understanding. I think it's an example of, you know, why do some people get sick and other people don't get sick? And, you know, there's, you know, and that's a very simple, not, you know, not a virus that was going to kill anybody. Um, so Erica asks, uh, wondering what is the pathogenesis of post-infectious IBS? Is it related to a dysbiosis and can it be treated through the microbiome? And that's a good question. I don't know the answer to. I'm not a, an expert on inflammatory bowel disease, but you know we have to be careful with this nomenclature of you have dysbiosis, things aren't right, or you're in imbalance. You know, we're trying to understand what that means because you know from time to time, you know, a friend of mine went and. Um, He's a microbiome scientist and he went to Thailand and he uh, took his, a sample of his microbiome before he got on the plane, when he was sleep deprived, when he got to Thailand, when he got diarrhea in Thailand, when he came back. And, you know, it's going all over the place, you know. And so um, I think it's very important to understand that some of us have a level of resilience, which is you can get perturbed, but you go down. Resistance is you push everything out of the way. Resilience is things go down, but they come right back up. Resistance is they never go down. You're just like a rock. And um, we need to understand what constitutes the tipping point for resistance and resilience of our microbiome before we can make these big judgments. But there's no doubt that there is a post-infectious neuropathy that occurs, like polio. You get the polio virus, you can't move your legs, the virus completely leaves your body, your nerves don't work. Why? Something happens with IBS where you get a germ, maybe a virus, maybe a virus inside your bacteria, your gut gets messed up, the doctors can't find anything, and, and your nerves endings in your, in your entire GI tract are all messed up. You have pain, you have constipation and diarrhea. You know, you're in chronic pain, you're addicted to opioids and you're like, what's wrong with me? And they go, well, you have dysbiosis. Well, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> and so we're looking for that single agent to be able to stamp out. And it's not that simple, which is why Simply the term also, somebody made a, somebody asked a question about probiotics. It's too much of a general term. What probiotics, for which patients, under what circumstances, what, what type of imbalance, you know, it, this is gonna be a very personalized recipe. And I don't know why, look, you know, to your point, uh, Christian, that was a very good example. I have a friend, a close friend that I trained with who is a vascular surgeon who died of COVID. And this guy and I would go to Chinatown in Chicago when we were residents and he would eat pig's feet and he had a little bit of a gut on him. His wife was thin and she's a nurse, a PhD nurse uh, and a leader in, in, in American nursing. They lived together. He died of the virus. She never got it. How, 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 do, we, how do we explain that? 
I mean, they're, they're living together. They're in the same bed. They're using the same shower. You know, there's intimacy. How can she not get it? I mean, you know, a question that we get that people, people often, I mean, if I tell my mother's story, people will say to me, uh, where did she get C. diff? And I always say, we don't know. You know, we find it in the environment. The University of Texas did a study a few years ago where they swabbed every place they could think of and they found C. diff everywhere. And so, you know, we're ingesting it at some point, we're colonized. And really what I've said to people is like, you know, the thing, the thing that is within our control is whether or not we take, not, you know, whether or not we take antibiotics at all, but certainly whether or not we take unnecessary antibiotics. And we know that 50% of outpatient unnecessary, I just had a friend uh, went to CityMD, uh, had what I think is the same virus that my nephew had, um, and he was given penicillin for, Penicillin is not going to help you if you have a virus, you know, but people expect to get something when they leave. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Teresa, do you have a, did you raise your hand for a question? You can come off mute and ask it if you'd like. Uh, I, I Thank you. And I appreciate the time here. Um, I, I just wanted, I am a C. diff and post-infectious IBSD survivor. Uh, I was actually misdiagnosed and given antibiotics, and that's what gave me the C. diff. Uh, of course, the doctors wanted to give me more antibiotics to cure the C. diff. It didn't make sense to me, and I healed my C. diff 100% holistically. I used nature. I used raw garlic. I used monolaurin. I used essential oils in the form of oregano because of its high level of carbocrawl, which gets to the spore of C. diff. Uh, I did heal from C. diff. And then I was left because my gut microbiome was obviously devastated with post-infectious IBSD. Uh, the diet that I consumed to heal from C. diff, which was a lot of fermented foods, like I said, the raw garlic and uh, some essential oils. Now I could not do the garlic and the fermented foods because they are high FODMAP and it, it made the IBSD worse. So I actually went on a low FODMAP diet. And again, I used essential oils and it took me about a year and a half between the C. diff and post-infectious IBSD to heal. Um, since then, I, I started my own group uh, to help people to heal holistically from C. diff. So I guess, doctor, my question to you is, everything that I have seen thus far to heal from C. diff is with more antibiotics or fecal matter transplants. And I think FMTs show their own... Um, their own liability in that not only are you getting perhaps the healthy bacteria from someone else's gut microbiome, but you're also getting in part their immune system. So I am cautious with that. What is mainstream medicine? What are doctors, how are doctors looking at holistic ways to help patients heal from C. diff because it's a great opportunity to bring the body back into balance. That is my experience. That is what I help people uh, to do because as we know, if you use antibiotics to heal C. diff, you have a 25% chance of recurrence. And if you get a second recurrence, then that goes up to 40%. And I've seen people reoccur from C. diff over and over. I'm wondering when Western medicine will actually catch up with the use of nature as cure. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll answer that very quickly. Uh, we have what's called next gen technology, which is what we use in the laboratory uh, in our animal models. And we can um, do 
of microbiome sequencing. We can sequence all the bugs that are there, know all their genes and all the metabolites. Uh, you get terabytes of data. You get thousands of data points that you have to interpret with a specific data display. You have to use a bioinformaticist to be able to weed through all the information that you get. But um, it's not enough to say, try this and try that. It, you know, we're out of the era of trial and error and alternative medicine. We, uh, we need to understand what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong at the very most fundamental scientific level. And, and that's where the technology is at the present time. I can't really comment on the word holistic medicine. I can't say, you know, eat garlic and this, that, and the other. There may be things in garlic that are helpful. We need to know what they are. And we need to know how they work. Uh, that's the only way we can move forward. I think that is part of the part of the frustration with this is that it is, you know, as you so rightly pointed out early on in your um, in your talk about that this is not this is not oh it's a bad bacteria or oh this person is a sick person it's it's the combination of those two things <laughs> happening at this you know it's like two things meeting each other and and the complication of why can I walk around maybe with C. diff spores in my gut for 40 years maybe even take antibiotics and never develop disease and then someone else um, who seems like, uh, you know, a relatively healthy person can take antibiotics once and they then go through multiple recurrences of C. diff. I mean, it's, it's, and I think what you're saying, and that, you know, we, we have a lengthy, lengthy blog post on our website, if people want to look at it about probiotics and, you know, how to choose one, if that's the route you want to take. But, um, you know, unfortunately, the reality of it is, is that a lot of them are not well regulated and so you don't really know what's in them and so you have to kind of become your own uh you have to educate yourself and know what you're buying um you know it's also why a lot of stuff with you know what's considered holistic medicine is difficult because it hasn't been put through the rigors uh of you know as dr alberti said of like looking at mouse models what works what doesn't work um we have a couple more questions, if you have time, Dr. Alberti. I have about three minutes. Okay. Um, okay. One of them is incredibly long. Um, so let's try this shorter one. Um, so this one, uh, Amy asks, what are the best strategies to use if you do need antibiotics? Like for bacterial prostate or urinary tract infections, it is sometimes not an option to avoid them. How can you best protect yourself from C. diff in that situation? Yeah, I, I don't think we pay enough attention to, um, to our, our, our dietary histories, right? You know, um, imagine a patient who's told they have cancer and they're about to have their colon operated on, you know, um, and, and, and they're worried that the doctor is going to find more cancer and they've been told all the complications they might have. They're not going to sleep the night before. They're gonna think this is my last meal. I don't know, maybe they're gonna have pepperoni pizza and slosh down three or four beers and a glass of wine. I don't know, the night before surgery, right? I mean, I don't know. I don't ask my patients what they ate the night before surgery, right? But, you know, we need to think about that week before surgery. What can we do to modify it? To me, you never know when you're gonna need antibiotics. You get a tooth abscess. so. It goes to what you and I, Christian, have talked about before this, uh, before this webinar was about how it's important to think about how you can modify your health, anticipating that you live in a world in a sea of microbes that one day might infect you. Stay lean, as lean as you can. Eat as well as you can, with few exceptions. Nobody's telling you not to have a glass of wine at your brother or sister or your own wedding but you know, you can't have two, three glasses of wine every night and recognizing everybody's got uncle Jimmy, uncle Jimmy, you know, drank and smoked his whole life and got shot in the head by a jealous husband, you know, when he was 90. <laughs> okay. You know, everybody's got uncle Jimmy, but we can't be all be uncle Jimmy's and we don't understand, you know, what uncle Jimmy's birth sequence was. 
You know, imagine if you were raised on a farm, got up at 4.30 every day, stood in poop, were breastfed till you were two years old, never took an antibiotic. And that I'm speaking of the Amish people. The Amish people have no allergies, no diabetes, and they kind of eat a high fat diet. And they're lean because they're up working early. And so we, we need to think about those populations whose microbiome from the day they're born programs their immune system and remains robust and resilient. And we need to think about how to do that for ourselves, recognizing that one day, John Alverdi, me, I'm gonna walk in and the dentist is gonna say, you need a root canal. And I'm gonna put you on clindamycin for two weeks. And I'm gonna be like, what? But that could happen tomorrow. Yeah, and contrary to the, um, to the Amish, um, in the U.S., Dr. Marty Blazer, who you may be familiar with, sure, published sure. an article. I mean, it's going to be close to ten years ago, in Nature, saying that you know people born after 1980, by the time they reached the age of 18, they'd had 20 courses of broad spectrum antibiotics. So you know, this is a very different population. <laughs> yeah. um, well, with that, we will let you go. You've been so generous with your time and your Thank knowledge. You. Um, if folks want to hang on for one second, I'll just tell you a little bit more about what we have coming up. Um, so I'm going to steal the spotlight from. All right. Thank Dr. you. Alberti. Thank you all thank for you listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Bye-bye. Um, and just let you guys know that we are, um, oops, it's this last slide. So um, we released a seed of care guide this spring, and we're now working on a cookbook with a dietitian who specializes in this stuff. And the goal is to help people recover and prevent recurrent C. diff. Um, we have a, our next webinar in September. Uh, we're still working on the exact date, but that will be focused on sepsis and C. diff cases. Um, there's been a lot of research about this, some of which uh, touches on what Dr. Alberti was saying um, in terms of like the baseline health of somebody when they get C. diff and what that means in terms of their ability to prevent going into septic shock. Um, and then we will be announcing our 2021 gala date uh, in the coming weeks. Um, in light of COVID, we're likely gonna have a hybrid event this year. So meaning we'll have something in person, but there'll also be a way to participate virtually if you're not comfortable coming out in person or if you don't live in New York City. Um, and uh, oops. lastly, um, if you're on social media, we definitely uh, encourage you to follow us. We share lots of information. We treat, uh, share lots of patient stories and tips. Um, if you yourself are a patient and you wanna share your story with us, you can do that at our website at peggyfoundation.org. Um, and lastly, if any of you are a doctor out there who treats C. diff, um, you can also join our physician directory, which we have on our website to help people find us. So I'm just going to check the comments, um, but I think we're more or less at our close here. Um, oh, sorry. All right. I showed you guys the wrong view. <laughs> I've done that before. Um, so not the end of the world, just look at the information. Um, does anyone have any questions for me about Peggy Lillis Foundation or uh, otherwise we can end here? All right, well, thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, it was our pleasure to host. Um, I think it was a great webinar. Um, and I think, you know, we got to do more research. Uh, we got to fund the agencies that do the research, the basic research like NIH that helps so much of Dr. Alberti's research. Um, so definitely, you know, stay in touch with us and there'll be plenty of ways for us to collaborate with you in the future. And I wish you all very good health and an enjoyable summer and check out our next webinar in September. Have a great night, everybody.